Thank you, Dr. Cotter. I'm Larry Weiner. I'm a urologist in Huntington, West Virginia, Marshall University, and I'd like to thank the Southern Medical Association for including me in this group. I'm already feeling more youthful. <laughs> I'd like to present a case of a patient I saw recently. This is a 65-year-old man who's been to see several physicians for difficulty voiding. He's been getting up at night, he's been struggling to urinate, straining, has a weak stream. He's already gone through the Tamsulosin finasteride dance, uh, been taking the medication for several months, not getting any better, came to see me. His uh, past history was really unremarkable. Uh, I did a prostate exam, his prostate was slightly enlarged, but his PSA was normal. Uh, we examined his urine, he had a pH of 5, he had a trace of blood in his urine, but his urine culture and his urine cytology were both negative. So I thought, well, perhaps he has a urethral stricture. So I straight cathed him, and the catheter went in very easily, so he didn't have a stricture, but his post-void residual volume was elevated at 100 ml. So I think you can guess by the title of this talk what I was thinking about. So when should I suspect that my patient has a bladder stone? Well, as in this case, urinary symptoms fail to resolve with standard therapy. But also, especially in elderly or institutionalized patients, we see urinary infections that never seem to go away. You put them in antibiotics, they always come back. Also, the, the patient might describe unusual rituals, such as uh, uh, straining to uh, initiate flow more than usual, even leaning to the side, uh, slapping themselves. We can often get some interesting stories. Or perhaps they have persistent hematuria. Now, do you have to be a urologist to diagnose a bladder stone? Anyone? No. Uh, all you need to do is get an imaging study and uh, as you can see, it's usually not subtle. Uh, here's an ultrasound of the bladder showing a stone with shadowing. Here's a non-contrasted CT. So um, what are some facts about bladder stones? Well, they represent about 5% of all cases of nephrolithiasis. They predominantly occur in males, although the female incidence is expected to rise because of the popularity of implanted pelvic mesh, which can be put in for a variety of conditions, usually pelvic prolapse, urinary incontinence. A lot of these procedures are being done, and uh, there's a risk of the mesh eroding into the bladder and causing a foreign body reaction, which would result in a stone. The etiology in males is usually obstruction from benign prostatic hyperplasia. Bladder stones are endemic in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, secondary to the diet, and also to parasites, most commonly schistosomiasis. At one stage in their life cycle, the schistosomes lay eggs within the submucosal layer of the bladder, leading to a foreign body reaction. And as with stones in the kidney, the composition can be uh, variable, uh, calcium, uric acid, struvite. Well, bladder stone diagnosis and treatment uh, was about the same for most of recorded history. Uh, the panel on the left shows a set of Roman sounds and catheters which were unearthed at an archaeological site in present-day Turkey. In the middle panel, we have a set of sounds from a Civil War set. The reason why these instruments are called sounds is that the way you would diagnose a bladder stone in those days, you would pass the metal instrument into the bladder and clink it against the stone. And when you heard the sound, then you'd know the patient had a bladder stone. And then uh, the instruments on the right are called lithotrites. And this is from about the same era as the, the Civil War set. And what this is basically is a sound that you can open up and physically crush the stone by, by screwing it down. Now you might think that this sounds rather barbaric. You're not alone. Uh, there was a famous physician uh, who wrote an oath about 2,400 years ago. Uh, we all took this oath when we got our degrees. And there are two procedures which physicians are prohibited from performing in that oath. Does anyone know what those two are? 
Right, and what was the other one? Yes. Exactly. So you're prohibited from doing what I do, and also you're prohibited from performing abortions. Well, um, things didn't change a whole lot until the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, with the development by uh, Wilhelm Röntgen of the X-ray. Uh, this is a, uh, an early radiograph showing an obvious bladder calculus, and this was a, a great leap, uh, a minimally invasive and non-invasive way of diagnosing stones. It didn't involve passing a barbaric instrument into the patient. Uh, this is actually not uh, Willem uh, Röntgen. This is actually Maximilian Nitze, his countryman. Nitze was the developer of the cystoscope. And between the two inventions, what we have is the current state of the art for treatment of bladder stones, which is direct visualization uh, under anesthesia and use of the laser to break the stone up. So. This is where we are now. Uh, occasionally it is necessary to open a patient to retrieve a stone. This is an example of what we call a jack stone. Uh, most bladder stones are round, but this one uh, looks especially painful. Uh, and this one was removed with the open procedure. Now this is not a bladder stone. This is a geode, which you may have studied in geology in college, and the way these form is you have a hollow rock where minerals have precipitated inside. And this is an especially pretty one. Uh, it's an amethyst geode, and it has uh, colored quartz crystals on the inside. Now, there's a reason why I'm showing you this. Let's get back to our patient that I showed you in the beginning. So I tried to find a cause in the office. I couldn't, so I took him to the cystoscopy suite. We put him to sleep, and I looked in his bladder with the cystoscope. And lo and behold, I found two stones about the size of robin's eggs, and I started to chip away at these with the laser. And interestingly, they had the structure of geodes. They had a, a hollow center, and they had a three millimeter shell. And inside the shell were these crystals, and it reminded me of the pictures of geodes that I had studied in my geology. So I evacuated all the stone material from the patient, we sent it off to the lab, and it turned out that the stones were made of uric acid. And inside the uh, shell were crystals of ammonium urate. So it, it squared very well with the patient's urine, his pH was five, and we put him in allopurinol and sodium bicarbonate, and to date, he has not recruited his stones, and his symptoms are gone. Well, the patient was finished, but my work had just begun. I'd never heard of anything like this. I'd never seen this before. So I did a literature search, and I found that the only reported incidence of geodes in vivo was one laboratory study that had been done in rats. In a rat kidney model, they had induced the formation of geotype stones, but it had never been recorded in humans. So I contacted Mark Wilson, who is the head of the section of minerals at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. And he said that he had never heard of anything like this, but the thing that really struck him was the time course, that the uh, geodes in this gentleman had formed on the order of years, whereas in nature, geodes take millions of years to form, so that whatever conditions occurred in this man's bladder occurred several orders of magnitude faster than what is seen in nature. Now for a geode to form in nature, you have to have three things. You have to have semi-permeable rock through which water can flow. You have to have a cavity within that rock. And in the case of igneous rock, this might be a bubble that's left over from the lava. Or in the case of sedimentary rock, it might be some organic material that has decayed. A piece of wood, an animal. But at any rate, when you have that cavity, then you have supersaturated water that's flowing through this. And over time, and in this case millions of years, it will develop the standard crystal formation that we see in geodes. And then as more millions of years go by, the surrounding rock will dissolve away, leaving you with the geode. 
and uh, the, the geodes uh, are called nature's treasure. Uh, most of them are very beautiful when they're split, and I challenge you to go through any uh, gift shop at a museum with your kids or grandkids and avoid purchasing one of these for them. So it was an interesting case, but the take home is really not so much the geode, but just to consider a diagnosis of bladder stones when your patient's voiding symptoms fail to improve on standard therapy over a reasonable period of time. Get that patient to a urologist and you have two happy people, the patient and the urologist. Thank you. <laughs>